All right, well, we are going to jump into our teaching today. It's called Redeeming Christmas has been our series. We've taken the elements of Christmas, and we've really just kind of talked through um, what are some of the historical roots of what, of what we use, kind of the levers we pull to celebrate Christmas, the tree, the celebrations, all these different things that we've, we've looked into. Today, we are going uh, to turn ourselves towards Christmas lights, and uh, we're going to look at it because we need to understand the depth of theology when it comes to the word light. There's a lot going on. When you talk about light in our faith, in the faith of Jesus Christ as revealed through the Old and the New Testament, we understand that light is a big deal. Now, when I think Christmas lights, I have a distinct phrase that runs through my head, and it's 20, 250 strands of imported Italian twinkle lights, 100 strands of bulb, make, or 100 bulbs of strand, making for 25,000 twinkle lights. Clark W. Griswold, anybody else love it? I'm going to make my wife love that movie. All right, I'm going to edit out all the bad parts, and then you're going to like it, Erica. Um, it's, it's so good, right? When I think of Clark, and like they're doing their tongue drum roll, and he's like, you know, he's so anxious, and the click, nothing happens. He's like, what's going on? But when the lights finally come on, you remember how he cries? He's like, it's just a beautiful Christmas, and then Cousin Eddie shows up, and we all have cousin Eddie. So you, you identify with this, right? You can feel like when, when everything lights up, when you drive through little downtown Zealand, even now as the snow's falling outside and you're like, oh, it's going to be pretty tonight. It's going to look like this perfect little place. We know it's not, but it's still awesome. It's our town. And we look at it like, oh, the lights and everything make it so awesome. And then February comes, they take the lights down and it's just gray. And you realize how much you love the lights and you want them back because Christmas makes it wonderful, right? We love Christmas lights. We love to light it up, and I believe there's an, in, an instinctive need in us to do this, and here's why. When we look at Jesus Christ, we recognize that Jesus Christ is the first word of creation, the first word of creation. Scripture makes that clear in John 1 and Genesis 1, and the first word of creation was light. So needless to say, when we talk about Jesus, we talk about the light of the world. We talk about the light that shines down. We talk about the light that permeates everything. And today, I would like to kind of pivot us towards a scripture out of Luke chapter 2. And I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory on it, okay? That we're going to talk about Luke chapter 2, I think 25 to 32. And in this section of scripture, we have an old wise prophet. Okay, I want you to think biblical prophet. Gray beard, awesome robe, and kind of intimidating. Simeon is his name. It's even a cool name, right? Simeon. And Simeon is this prophet who has been waiting for the consolation of Israel. He's waiting for the Messiah to come and redeem Israel. And one day, God speaks to Simeon. He says, go to the temple, and we'll pick up the story there. There was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. Super critical right there. You may think, like, I don't know what on is, if it's an adverb or something. Grammatically, I'm not gifted. But um, I do know this. The difference between on and in him are significant in our faith because before Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit would descend on people. But after Jesus Christ, it came into people. It filled people. Big difference. But anyways, uh, the Holy Spirit was on him. And it had been reveal, revealed to him, Simeon, by the Holy Spirit, that he would not die before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Holy Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought, the child, brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was the custom that the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. Who here has ever had a baby and you bring it to church and someone's like, oh, Mr. Cute, and they pick it up and you're like, put the child down. You may have the flu. Anybody ever seen that happen? You see a new mom, she's like, oh, okay, no. No. She's mine, right? Imagine this. Imagine with me what it was like. Mary is this, is this just little tiny teenage girl. She's 15 or 16 years old. She's walking with her soon-to-be husband, a little scandal there, into the temple courts holding a baby. And an old prophet walks up and grabs onto it. Just, just imagine with me. What does a teenage girl say to an old prophet in the temple? 
What, what does she do? I mean, imagine what you do. She'd be like, no, sir. Or would she be like, oh. It quickly comes to light what Simeon's purposes are. He says this, sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. What he's saying is, kill me, leave me alive. I'm all good. I'm good to go. I'm happy. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. Jerusalem was and continues to be the crossroads of the world. And so what we understand is that all the nations are right there. And Simeon's got this little baby in his hands. And he says, he is a light for revelation to the Gentiles. <clears throat> and the glory of your people, Israel. Oh, can you imagine? Like somebody taking your child and saying that saying those words and saying this child is a light for revelation to the Gentiles, which means that this was no longer a covenant bound to the descendants of Abraham. God was about to open the curtain for everybody. He was going to open it up and all would come to God through this one individual who would be a light to all the world who would be a light. The very first word of creation is echoing back out Jesus over the universe. And it's happening from the Temple Mount. Jesus would pick up on this theme in his own life and ministry. And in John chapter 8, verse 12, we find Jesus talking during the, during the festival of lights. So what we understand is Jesus is speaking and he says these words concerning himself. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness again, but will have the light of life. It's a big deal. Jesus understands who he is. And I wonder if the boy Jesus grew up hearing the words of Simeon spoken over him. I wonder if when Jesus came home from a rough day in middle school, or as we call it, middle school, right? And there's a lot of rough days. You got to work through it. And if he came home feeling stupid because somebody said, okay, son of God, you know, Mr. My Mom wasn't married, okay. And he came home dragging his head like, oh, it's been another hard day. And his mom said, don't you forget that the prophet Simeon held you close and declared that you would be a light to the Gentiles. You, son, are different. Oh, so that when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will no longer walk in darkness, but they will walk in the light of life. D doesn't it resonate a little? Don't you? And, and maybe you don't, but I do. I feel the earth tremble a little bit. Like it wants to be like, oh, yes, I like it. Like somewhere in the Pacific, a volcano came up. You know, just because it's true. The Son of God was there. He knew who he was. He knew what he was called to do. And he would be light in the darkness. We don't understand darkness the way the ancient world does. The sun currently sets in Bethlehem, um, not Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, but Bethlehem uh, in Israel at 447 in the afternoon. Ugh. We thought we had a bad in Michigan at 514, right? The sun sets at 447. That's a bad goal weight and time of day. Right? You don't want that. That's early. And they didn't have lights to switch on. Edison had not yet done his magic. If you had money, you could buy candles or even an oil lamp. If you were poor, well, it's time for it to be dark. And it doesn't come up again for 14 hours. Now, the last time I got 14 hours of sleep, I think somebody drugged me. Right? I was a teenager. What do you do for 14 hours in the dark? We don't understand the kind of darkness people lived with in the ancient world. What it was like for light to invade the darkness. But every tradition around the world has, especially those in the more extreme polar regions, have these understanding. So the Jewish people had the understanding, and it really came through Hanukkah. Hanukkah is a celebration that took place after the period of silence. So let me explain this. You have the Old Testament of the Bible, time up to 400 years, the prophet Malachi, that's when the last book of the New Testament was written. 400 years of silence take place, and then Jesus is born. In that 400 years of silence, there was a miracle around the Maccabean revolt. The Maccabees were a family of, of zealots and, and kind of street fighters, and they loved God, and they were passionate about fighting for God. 
but there was a time when they had enough oil to light a lamp for one day. And if you wonder why there's Hanukkah, Hanukkah is an eight-day festival because one day's worth of oil burned for eight days. So they celebrate the eight days of Hanukkah, the eight days that God provided light into the darkness. And Jesus Christ would be light into the darkness, right? We understand that looking back. They didn't at the time. So the Norse people, the, the old Norse, like Sweden and Nor Norway and those different people, they have everything from the Yule log to candle lighting ceremonies, anything to do what? Light the darkness. To light the darkness and dispel to the borders of our existence the darkness. Everybody does this. Christians first use candles to remember the star of Bethlehem. Victoria and Albert, and Queen Victoria, they're the first ones to really decorate a tree and pose in front of it with candles on it to light the Christmas tree, leading to a lot of people doing that in a lot of house fires. And they had these kinds of things where people were kind of transfixed with light at Christmas season. Why? Because we understand, even maybe we don't understand theologically, we understand right here in the middle of our soul, there's something about this season that requires me to flip a switch, strike a match, have some light in the room. Why? Because the light of the world is coming near. I know, right? That is legit. We don't even know why we do it. Pagans don't know why they do it. They just know this time of year needs lights. And in January, they take them down thinking, oh, why don't we keep them up all year? I don't know, but we don't. But we know the light of the world has come. We know that Grover Cleveland, first president in 1895, to electrically light a Christmas tree. And he did that because Edison made the light bulb. And for the first time in human history, we could flip a switch and light came on. And the darkness was dispelled. I don't know if you've ever been in dark darkness, but it's scary, right? Where you're like, where's my hand? And it's right there, right? That kind of darkness, and they began to dispel it now through electricity. We understand even now, we have these horrible, sh not horrible, I take it back, it's kind of awesome and magical, the great Christmas light fight. Anybody ever watch that? Somebody is calling me right now. It's my mom. <laughs> I should have FaceTimed her and been like, check that out, mom. <laughs> Who called? It's Sunday morning, mother. All right, this sermon goes online, and she's going to be like, oh, Merry Christmas. All right. Phew. She's getting even with me. That's awesome. All right. <laughs> Okay, great Christmas light fight. You have these people who decorate their houses to all these different things, right? Nowadays, we put lights up that make like, oh my goodness, we're just killing fossil fuels. Not that they weren't dead, but we're really getting after it these days. We love Christmas lights in our culture. And what, what makes me understand this natural response to what God did at Christmas is we really don't often, as the pagan world, know why we do it. We just know that we need to. So what we understand is there was a night that was incredibly dark in a world that had yet to really see light as God intended it. There was a night in Bethlehem where the sun set at 4.40 p.m. And a teenage girl grabbed her stomach and went, oh, this might be real. And her, hus her husband-to-be was frantically looking for a room in which she could give birth to her son, and they found a barn on a cold night in Bethlehem when darkness hovered close and a child came into the world and light was born to us. See, we need to understand that the world's darkest night was actually the starting of a brand new dawn. That all that had been broken would be set right in the coming of the light of the world. The first word of creation would have his first cry for help in a barn stable. The first word of creation, the light of the world, would be held in tiny, frail arms by a girl who's physically exhausted and a husband who's running around probably looking for hot water and not knowing what to do. When we think about light invading this world, we have to think of a dark place because the darker it was, the more brilliantly light shone the more brilliantly the light came to life. And I believe that as we as Christians understand that the lights we light up are a joyful remembrance of who Christ is, the more we come alive in what his identity and purpose is in this world. You see, you had Bethlehem on a very dark night. 
But you also had angels who went out to the shepherds in the fields and they parted and peeled back the curtains of heaven to where the shepherds were like, what? And they said, you got to go to this barn because everything that matters is there. And the heavens lit up with angels, singing glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill to those on whom his favor rests. Ooh, what a night to be a shepherd, right? When the light finally came. And then there's Simeon, eight days later, Simeon taking the child out of Mary's arms and being this one, this baby will be a light to the Gentiles. He will be the light. He has always been the light and now he will be the light and he will bring the world to him, and by his wounds, we will be healed. That is really good news on a dark night. When light invades and the darkness bends the knee to the one who gave its first separation, light from dark. When Christ comes into the world. I believe Jesus' own words in John chapter 8 are an important reality for us to grab onto, but they're even more important when we recognize what's that, what's said in the previous chapter in John chapter 7, when we understand that the lamp lighting ceremony in John chapter 7 is what precludes what Jesus says about being the light of the world. This is what happens in John chapter 7, what Jesus speaks of. There would have been a lamp lighting ceremony taking place in the temple every evening of the feast, during which large lamps were set up in the court of women. The lamp's light, it said, was uh, filled every corner of the courtyard. And this would have been from the Apocrypha, the intertestamental books. In the light of these lamps, there was great dance, singing, dancing all evening in celebration of God's salvation, especially remembering the deliverance of God's people out of slavery in Egypt in Exodus. And he guided them by the presence of what? By the pillar of fire at night. See, even Israel was celebrating the festival of light, not knowing that it was a few good riffs that God was playing before the true symphony of salvation would come into the world. Like when I look at this and I'm like, yes, Jesus Christ, after this celebration, stood up and said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. And whosoever walks and follows me will never walk in darkness again. See, when we sanitize scripture, we have Jesus being like, I am the light of the world. And it's very nice. And it almost sounds a little Barney-esque. But when you hear Jesus saying, after the festival of lights, where the people remember the exodus from slavery, the pillar of fire, Hanukkah, and then Jesus Christ, this carpenter from, ba uh, from Nazareth, stands up and says, I am the light of the world. Once again, the foundations of earth tremble under the weight of him who is the first word of creation. And light would dawn into our darkness that could never be dispelled. The darkness will never overcome it. So what we understand is that in this moment, God is revealing to us the true light, the light of the world, and we are called to it. So what I would like to do is help look at it in a couple of ways. I would like to invite you to just go on a Christmas light drive. And if you're a dad and you don't, you're not into it, okay, Ebenezer, knock it off and go look at lights. They're awesome. All right, sorry. And if you're a mom that way, that's not natural. All right. Um, <laughs> sorry, it may be. It's just not for me. I'm not a mom. Um, but let the lights remind you. Let them be a visible reminder that God didn't leave you alone in the dark. That God didn't see that you were worthy to be cast off into eternal darkness. But what did he do? He shed light over this world through the light of Christ. And he called you to himself. Let every twinkling light you see remind you that into the darkness, Christ has come. And Christ has shined light into our life. Often it's a conviction of sin and we feel guilt and we want to repent. Why? Our repentance brings us into reconciliation with who? With Christ. And we share in the light. My friends, let this Christmas, every light you see, every twinkling bulb, every candle flickering, let it be a testimony that into the darkness... God once again invaded with his light. And he has brought his life along with it. The next thing I'd like you to do is receive the light. So often we find ourselves um, not wanting to receive, right? We're just, you know, it's good to be a part of the church maybe and be like, yeah, I like Christmas. I'll come once, twice a year, especially at Christmas. But, but actually receive it. Don't let Jesus be part of your week. 
Let Jesus be all that you are. Receive into you the light of the world. Receive into you something that transforms you, right? Anybody here ever seen somebody who's maybe fair-haired and fair-skinned get sunburned? <laughs> it's so magical. Like you go to the beach and they fall asleep and you're like, yes. Because you know like 35 minutes and they are lobstered. But you know, an hour later you're like, I should wake them, but I can't. I just got to keep watching. I think I see a bubble. Like it's just great, right? You just watch them and they stand up and they're like, oh, Oh, and then they turn, and there's a line, and you're like, huh. <laughs> Christmas in July. That's what you are, my friend. My red-headed friend who was horribly burned, right? Because what? When they were in the light, the light transformed them, right? I, I want to invite you to think of it this way, not so much as a sunburn, but think of it as this. The light, the light changes us. It changes how we see things. It transforms us from people comfortable looking through the dark, like wandering through the darkness to purposefully on a mission for the glory of God. Receive the light and live in it. Don't make excuses for why being in the light's too much. Go live in the light of Christ and let your life become a very manifestation of the light of Christ around you. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we love you and we thank you for who you are, for what you're doing. God, we recognize that in, uh, in our lives, we are often lost in our own darkness. But thanks be to you, God, who into the darkness sent the brightest of lights, that an infant baby would be born, and that you would care for the needs of all people through his life, his death, and his resurrection. Come, we pray, Lord Jesus Christ. And reveal to us what it means to be people who live in the light of the very first word of creation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may not know this, but it's a, it's a cool fact that when you're out in the middle of a place that has no natural lighting on a moonless night, that if you hold up a candle flame, you can see that candle from 30 miles away. And if you think of a weary traveler or a lost person, you can understand with me how much that light would matter because it would be a point where you could go towards. And we recognize today that for us as the church, we bear the light. And so today I invite you that if you have received Jesus Christ to be someone who carries forward that hope, that Christ, that very light of the world in all that you do. So we're going to do something a little different as the kids head back. You can go ahead and take them back to shake out. Um, well done, guys. You did super good. Nobody swallowed a candle. <laughs> what we're going to do today is there's not going to be a, a formal benediction as we normally do. Uh, we're going to sing the benediction. It's called the Christmas Hallelujah. And um, I'm going to invite you to stand in just a second once the little ones are down the aisle and, um, and, and take part in the benediction. Benediction is a Greek thing, bene, good, uh, diktos word, benediction. Um, so you're going to speak some of the last good words of our Christmas season um, as we sing them together. And I just want to take a minute and thank you as a church. We, have, um, we had a, an opportunity to do some love and ministry to our own congregation and um, we as a church knew that we may have to bear some of that bill. So we, we underwrote with our mission account uh, a, what I consider a large amount of money. And we didn't spend a dime as a church because you gave so generously to meet the needs of people in this church. And uh, people really all over this country were reached out to and blessed by the Foundry Church. And I would like to say a good word to you. Good word to you of Thank you. Thank you for partnering in the gospel work by being generous in a season that's already expensive. Thank you for your time, your treasure, and your talents, and the way you invest in the kingdom of God. It is a blessing to be a part of this and to pastor with you in the priesthood of all believers as we take the gospel and the light forward. Thank you for being part of what we're doing here at the Foundry. That being said, I'm going to invite you now to stand up and join me in the benediction. When it's done, you are free to go.